For many current fans, WWE's storied Attitude Era was a moment of providence, the place where their wrestling fandom kicked off. Though not everything from that period has aged gracefully, WWE Attitude was a fun time in its time, an endless font of excitement and spontaneity. It's understandable why many fans clamour for a return to those wild Monday nights, feeling a reprisal would be just the tonic to rekindle their love of pro wrestling. At different points, WWE, knowing the audience audience's high demand for their personal nostalgia has mined copiously from the successful Attitude Era, be it in merchandise, concepts, or even in bringing back the participants themselves. From The Rock electrifying crowds once more, to DX hamming it up in a cool dad kind of way, to Chris Jericho infecting the landscape with more vignettes that led to an anticipated countdown. Not every Attitude veteran earns the same hoopla the second or third time around, though. Quite a few season names from those halcyon TV 14 days have turned up and vanished once more, with far less impact than others. This video is dedicated to those such performers. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com, and these are 10 forgotten returns of Attitude Era stars. Join us! Number 10. D'Lo Brown in his day, the head-shaking, trash-talking D'Lo seemed to be a star on the rise, a heavyweight grappler with impressive agility and an infectious physical charisma that made him unique among an eclectic peer group. He'd previously held European and intercontinental gold, so there was certainly a reasonable amount of faith in Brown as a featured player. His time with WWE sadly fell off track around the turn of the millennium, with both the low-down tag team and the tutelage of Theodore Long failing to restore his former glory. In the summer of 2008, more than five years after leaving the company, Brown returned to WWE on an episode of Raw, defeating Santino Morella. After that, however, Brown only wrestled in a handful of TV bouts, losing to the likes of Morella and Mike Knox. For the remainder of the year, Brown served to put over others on house shows before getting released by the company at the onset of 2009, ending a six-month resurgence. By the time D'Lo was released, his use was so minimal that most forgotten he'd even come back. Number 9. Gangrel he may never have captured gold in WWE, but Gangrel had something even better than championship glory. A positively badass entrance in which he rose up from the fiery catacombs of hell itself amid ominous backmask filled theme music. Admit it, whenever you created yourself on whatever WWE game you owned two decades ago, you gave yourself Gangrel's entrance, didn't you? I know I did. Certainly, a man like Gangrel left his mark on the business, not to mention a few necks along the way. <laughs> it's those indelible memories that gave Gangrel a second chance in the mid 2000s, though it wasn't like most of us got to see it. After a one off on SmackDown in 2004 that called back to his time as a ministry henchman, Gangrel was signed to WWE Development the following year, appearing in a few matches before disappearing once more. In 2006, Gangrel was signed yet again with the intent of putting him with Kevin Thorne and Ariel on ECW. He once again tooled around in developmental, save for a house show match with none other than CM Punk, before getting magnesium staked by John Laurinaitis in early 2007. Number 8. Grandmaster Sexa 20 years ago, we witnessed an unlikely revelation. Two House of Pain wannabes and a 400-pound Samoan in a thong line dancing together and the crowd going mad for all of it. Too Cool and Rikishi found the pulse of the ticket-buying wrestling fan, ones who clapped encouragingly whenever the magic sunglasses were placed on Rikishi's face. The party was over by 2001, compounded by Sex A, aka Jerry Lawler's son Brian, getting fired from WWE for trying to bring drugs over the border into Canada. Three years later, there seemed to be a shot at redemption. In the spring of 2004, in one of Jim Ross's final acts as the head of talent relations, Grandmaster Sex A was brought back to WWE and placed on the Raw brand. He floundered as a singles act, losing to fellow stars of the now bygone era in Kane and Christian prior to being released after just one month. Coincidentally, over on SmackDown at the time, Rikishi and Scotty Too Hotty reigned as tag team champions. It took nearly another decade before the trio was reunited inside a WWE ring. Number 7. Test Defeating Shane McMahon in a sleeper of a brawl at the 1999 SummerSlam marked the high point of Test's wrestling career. For the three months that followed, he enjoyed a spot near the top of the company hierarchy as Stephanie McMahon's fiancé, only for everything to unravel, as is often the case for many, at the end of the wedding. Five years and much mid-card occupancy later, Test was let go from WWE while mending at home following major neck surgery. 
Though he offered blistering criticisms of WWE in the year and a half that followed for both the circumstances of his firing and their use of Eddie Guerrero's name after his death, Test re-signed with the company in the spring of 2006. That summer, he resurfaced on the ECW brand and was positioned as precisely the sort of muscle-bound sports entertainer that the extreme faithful would root against. Though Test was highly visible in this time, said time was short, as he disappeared from WWE shortly after the 2007 Royal. Royal Rumble. Less than a year after signing a deal to come back, the 31-year-old was let go shortly after he was reportedly suspended for a wellness violation. Number 6. The Headbangers Mosh and Thrasher took the typical path to the top of WWE's tag team scene, going from enhancement talents to lascivious nuns to unkempt metalheads, not unlike the Hart Foundation and the British Bulldogs before them. Though never a top team for long, the Headbangers are still deeply interwoven into Attitude Law, a solid mid-card duo with a unique gimmick. Nonetheless, it was still a bit beyond the pale to see Mosh and Thrasher turn up on SmackDown in 2016 after the second brand split had kicked off. Chris Jericho wasn't pro wrestling's only aging rocker, as the skirt-wearing tandem competed in the tournament to crown SmackDown's tag team title holders, losing to eventual winners Heath Slater and Rhino in the quarterfinals. They only appeared twice more on the brand, losing to the Usos in a brief Survivor Series match on one of those occasions. As far as random callbacks go, Mosh and Thrasher's all-too-brief resurgence really was as random as it got. Number 5. Al Snow Snow's wrestling resume hits on many different fronts, demonstrating tremendous range. He's been a consummate in-ring performer, as demonstrated in ECW and Smoky Mountain in the mid-90s, and he's also been a diligent trainer, helping train the likes of John Morrison, Cody Rhodes, Ryback, Adam Cole, and others, in addition to the Tough Enough hopefuls. But for many fans, Snow is best remembered as the clown prince of WWE's hardcore division, arguing with a mannequin head and dispensing unhinged wackiness on the reg. And that's certainly not a bad way to make a living. By the spring of 2003, Snow was phased down as a full-time wrestler on the Raw brand, focusing mainly on training, commentary, and the occasional outside indie booking. One more comeback was in the offing, though it was only to provide a veteran presence on a new brand. When ECW hit Sci-Fi in 2006, Snow was put to use as a dutiful undercarder, losing to the likes of Test and Kevin Thorne on the weekly shows. After just a few months of quick defeats, Snow quietly faded from ECW. Number 4. The Blue Meanie we here at Cultaholic take time to read the comment sections on these videos, so don't worry. We haven't forgotten that Blue Meanie and JBL had a bloody skirmish at ECW One Night Stand, as some of you have been apt to remind us. Yes, JBL going way over the line and busting up the Blue Guy is disturbingly memorable, and it hasn't escaped us either, but what's sometimes forgotten is that the scuffle wasn't Meanie's only WWE appearance that summer. Six years after he served both the Job Squad and Gold Dust on WWE programming, and not long after One Night Stand, Meanie actually signed a short term deal to come back to WWE. He wound up defeating JBL in a no DQ match on an episode of SmackDown thanks to interference from both the Blue World Order and Batista. His final appearance came at the Great American Bash that July, where he, Big Stevie Cool, and Hollywood Nova lost to three other ECW alums in the Mexicals. Hopefully, whatever blows he landed on JBL made it worthwhile. Number 3. Henry Godwin Okay, so maybe the yellow shirt wearing hog farmer was more of a new generation talent than he was Attitude, but you know what? He was still there in 1998, competing at WrestleMania 14 and duking it out in the Brawl for All, so yeah, Henry Godwin is an Attitude era guy. Of course, that's not to say that Godwin had a long shelf life once WWE embraced its TV-14 designation, lingering neck injuries marked the probable end of his career as he bowed out of WWE in late 1998. After more than seven years on the sidelines, however, Godwin suddenly returned, working a dark match in Ohio Valley, as well as a pair of dark matches at Raw and SmackDown in September 2006. Later that year, Godwin was sent down to Deep South Wrestling to team with Ray Gordy, yes, Slam Master Jay, as the new Godwin with Gordy repackaged as a previously unmentioned cousin to Henry. Come the spring of 2007, however, Gordy was moved to a team with the future Luke Gallows, and Henry released from the company shortly thereafter. Number 2. Jeff Jarrett 
Granted, Jarrett's return was only one year ago, but it feels like it's been an absolute eternity, doesn't it? When Jarrett left WWE 20 years ago under highly contentious circumstances, it was assumed that hell would freeze over and Tout would become a viable social media product before Double J ended up smashing guitars inside a WWE ring once more. Lo and behold, the identifier of those who slapped nuts went into the Hall of Fame in 2018 and eventually returned to the Stamford Fold as a producer. But for as long as that gap felt between the good housekeeping send-off and the hatchet burial, it feels like even longer has passed since Jarrett's mini-feud with Elias, which began at the 2019 Royal Rumble. To the strains of familiar low-key country music, Jarrett strutted out once more, not only as a surprise Rumble entrant, but to wrestle Elias the following week on Raw, complete with Road Dogg seconding Jarrett yet again. Given all that's happened in wrestling in 2019, Jarrett's return has almost entirely been overshadowed, but that's just life in the fast-moving digital and social age we live in. Number 1. Gold Dust Dustin Rhodes was not unlike Marty Jannetty in that he may have called WWE home for many cumulative days, but said days are spread over various tenures, coming and going with a bit of frequency. As far as his attitude iconography goes, Gold Dust was attitude before attitude, pushing boundaries with his sexually charged mannerisms and mind games, stepping out of Father Dusty's shadow in a way that few would have accurately forecasted. After leaving WWE in 1999, depending on how you sort out his future tenures, he came back four times in all. His 2002 and 2013 revivals were memorable, and his turn of the decade run, complete with Oksana Wedding, a little bit less so. What qualifies him for this video, however, is his 2005 return, beginning with him acting as hired muscle for Jonathan Coachman in a brief feud with Batista. Wait, that happened? Sure did, as did a shift in the 2006 Royal Rumble match, and regular appearances on the long downgraded Sunday Night Heat, facing the likes of Rob Conway and Gene Snitsky. Goldust has had his share of enjoyable fountain of youth runs, but this here was not one of them. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.